case you don't know who I am, I am Robert, and this is Corvette World Dallas. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Brink of Speed. As you saw the intro there, this is not a typical come to Corvette world and do an inventory walk with Robert. This is getting to know Robert. So who is Robert? Who is Corvette world Rob? If you don't know who he is, I'm gonna go over and introduce you to the number one used Corvette salesman in the country. So let's, let's go meet him. And ladies and gentlemen, this is Corvette World Rob. Hello everyone and welcome. All right, Robert. So I know a lot of people out there are gonna to wanna to know how long you have been with Corvette World. So I've been here eight years. I started here in summer of 2016 and been here ever since. Nice, and you enjoy it? I do, I do. That's the only reason, it's actually outside of the US Army. This is the longest job I've ever had. I kept stuck with. And you've sold cars before, right? Yes, I did. I had a one-year stint at Huffine Chevrolet Plano, also uh, here in North Texas, and uh, a Ford dealership, which I shall not mention. <laughs> so obviously you trust the leadership at this dealership and the ownership. Yeah, dealership. after my experience at the aforementioned Ford dealership, uh, yeah, it, if, they if we didn't have a good staff, good leadership here, I'd have been long gone. I was okay. actually teetering on giving up on the automotive field. Okay, next, people are wanting to know, what is the relationship with Corvette World Dallas and Houston, and how long have they been in business? So, long story short, the founder of the company started as Texas Corvette Connection 89. Uh, shortly after it became Corvettes of Dallas, they moved to this location here, and then shortly after opened up the location in Houston under the same banner. Um, in between that, people may, that may be familiar with the company know if they briefly had an Austin store, but that was since uh, closed down. Um, but generally speaking, since the mid nineties, they've had both stores and, you know, under the same ownership, same umbrella ever since. Nice. That's very important for people to know, because I know that there's quite a few questions out there of, does the owner own both of them? Yes, or he is does. It two separate yeah. owners. Okay. Well, actually the ownership has changed. The founding owner actually had the property, but the Corvette, Corvettes of Dallas in, in name, was under a different entity briefly when they actually merged with Corvette World. Corvette World actually, the Corvette World name was a different entity. Corvettes of Dallas essentially was merged with Corvette World um, and it fell under an ownership, but the founding owner of Corvettes of Dallas uh, maintained ownership of the property, but then that changed hands and now the founding owner and another co-owner own the company. Cool. So let us know about the Corvette buy, sell and trade uh, process that goes on here because a lot of people are wanting to know like can they trade in their car can you guys <laughs> buy their car how does that all work in conjunction with them buying a car from you okay so obviously inventory we're a used car dealer now some people have called thinking we can you know make reservation we are not chevrolet now we do have due to our co-ownership have an affiliation with the chevy dealership but that's with that dealership ownership not with general motors so um, we strictly get our inventory. The majority of it comes through vehicle purchase directly from people selling cars to us, others by trade-in, and then others uh, by wholesale and or auction. Um, but the overall majority are people physically selling. So if somebody wants to sell us a car, they can contact us. They'll take in the information we need to get a bid, we'll make a bid offer, obviously pending physical inspection if they agree to it. You know, they'll either physically come here if they're local or you know, we'll ship it uh, if they're out of state. If uh, they have a trade, Corvette trades, obviously we bid them here because that's all we deal with regardless of your generation. If it is a non-Corvette trade, we work with third-party uh, dealerships and or broker wholesalers that work with us to get bids 
you know, obviously based on market wholesale value. If they um, wish to either debate between selling or um, trading, you know, they can, we'll give them a bid and they can make a decision if they want to trade, if they've got something they want or just sell it to us outright. I've had people do that as well. Perfect. Let's kind of transition to the service department and the parts department. Uh, kind of let people know what they can purchase over there in the parts department and then let people know about the service department and how they can install things over there and also work on multiple generations of vets. <coughs> and then one more thing, let everybody know the expertise that's over there in the service department. Yes, um, well, expertise is an understatement. We've got some of the best mechanics in the country, no questions asked. Like all full service dealerships, you know, they have a service and parts department, we do too. Um, we have some used parts and we have some stuff we can order brand new as well. We also sometimes have customers bring in their own parts. Obviously, they assume liability on those parts that they bring it in, but they can do so if need be. We can order directly from General Motors or third party uh, like, you know, Mid-America, Top Flight, you know, Ecklers. I mean, we'll work with third parties as well to get components in, but they also keep a pretty good stock over there as well. Um, for example, like C7 Aero Kits. We got a relationship with uh, C7 Carbon and sometimes ACS, you know, bring in stuff for them and customers bring their own stuff to have them install. Sure. As far as service goes, we don't do body work here, like uh, body shop work, we don't do that, but we do mechanical or uh, you know what they call um, accessory install. You know, like they like mentioned, uh, front splitter arrow kits or uh, you know, spoilers, we'll do stuff of that nature. We can do some body panel work, uh, but you know, we don't do body shop painting work. We have right. to outsource for that. But we have kind of that relationship with that. Uh, people want to find parts, like we got people at old Corvettes, they try to find parts. For example, myself, my 92. Um, <clears throat> even if they don't have it, they can at least try to find it. In which case they actually did for me, they found me some parts I didn't have, couldn't find. They did, um, you know, because we've had staff over there have been working here a long time, they know where to look. Um, as far as the expertise of our staff, well, case in point, as I mentioned, I've got a, uh, a service rep over there who's been working here 20 years. He's seen quite a lot and of course was a Corvette owner himself. Um, two out of three of my technicians combined have over almost 60 years of experience working on Corvettes. A lot of people talk about, for example, hard to work on engines like the C4 Crossfire or LT5 from the ZR1. Not to our guys, they know what they're doing. They, they really know how to work on them. They've, and we have Chevy dealerships um, local here sometimes call us asking for mechanical advice sometimes because our technicians have so much experience. And you do have a particular technician that can work on all generations. Is well, that actually, uh, technically, all three of them, we have three technicians okay. back there, all three of them can, but they've got varying degrees of experience gotcha. working as such. But the two most experienced ones, uh, they can work actually on all generations. Sweet. They have their more focus. You know, generally one will do newer, one the other one will work older. Okay. Now let's go ahead and transition back over here to the sales side. When you guys are taking in cars, uh, one of the things that I know you'll want to stress is how clean they are, but also how clean the title and the Carfax is on all of these cars that you guys take in. Well, the majority, the overwhelming majority of the cars we take in are have to be obviously, you know, the clean, well-maintained and or a good Carfax. Now, there is a tidbit with that when it comes to Carfax or auto check. Um, sometimes people have minor things. Somebody scratched their car shopping cart bumped up against it. They accidentally, the most common one we see is they curb their front splitter or their front nose on a parking stop because the car so sits so low and we didn't have cameras until recently in the front. You know, minor damage reports like that, so long as we can confirm it, we'll take in and we usually verify it. Um, sometimes we'll take mild accident cars so long as we have documentation. Um, but beyond that, generally we hunt the cleanest cars. We target low mileage. The majority of, there's other places like us in the country, even a competitor down the street from us. So we focus on with low mileage, nice, newer, or like new condition cars. We will sometimes take in high mileage if they're like mint. Like I got a car right now with 70,000 miles, but you would think it had 15,000. It's really nice. Those are the kind of uh, inventory you generally focus on. But the good news to everyone that buys from here is you guys stand behind your yes, we car. don't take it in if we can't stand by it. Right. And that's why we've rejected some. That's why we've had to tell people, yeah, it's not something we take here too high mileage or we can't come to an agreement. Like the reason we, one of the reasons we don't take in a lot of classics is, you know, generally speaking, people that have classics want more than what we're ever going to sell sure. it for. And, that, and I get it. It's understandable. You know, I'm kind of going through that right now with my own car, but you know, it's, you know, we, we got to be able to sell it. And that's why, you know, you know, my owner has been a stickler about keeping things at or below fair market value, if at all sure. possible. The handful of occasions, obviously we all dealt with COVID and the high market, but you know, 
we were reluctant participants in that, but we stayed at the market value, and as soon as it went down, we went right down with it. Right. Okay, next let's talk about people buying from all over the United States and really the world. Yes, actually, since I have been here, I have sold customers as far away as Australia and as close as city of Carrollton where we're at. I mean, I, it, we've seen it all. I have actually, I think I'm pretty close. I have to look into it, but I, I think I've literally sold to a customer at least one of every state in the country, including Alaska and Hawaii. Um, obviously those required extra shipping, but you know, that's, and uh, we don't do, we don't have overseas international shipping. So if anybody who buys either Hawaii or international, they have to arrange their own shipping, but the ones that have done it have made that happen. And it's been very interesting. In fact, my first overseas sale was to Kuwait um, my most memorable was to a, um, a gentleman in Australia. He bought a C7R from me, and he had to have it converted to right-hand drive. Nice. That was an interesting experience. That's yeah, awesome. but that was a neat experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, we do. Generally speaking, the majority of our customer base is the lower 48. Sometimes to Canada, but you got There's international rules, so you know, there's there's some steps with that. But we have done it to Canada too. So people can have peace of mind when buying from you and they're out of state. That's correct. Now, the only state that's a little finicky is California because of their emission laws. Sure. So that's why we do, you know, again, we make sure our car is passed. Texas does have a state inspection standard at least until 2025, then they're going away with it. But, you know, we tell people, look, we passed it, but, you know, a car may have tint. It may have things that may be acceptable here, may not be acceptable in their state. So we try to be upfront with them as much as possible so they don't get there and get a nasty surprise that, oh man, I got to pull this tint off. Oh, the exhaust is not legal here in my state, you know you know, we'll work with the customer with that. Sure. Okay, so let's go ahead and transition from Corvette World to you now. Um, everybody's wanting to know who you are, where you came from, you know, what your past is and your background is. So, at, long story short, I am a Midwestern kid. I am born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, generally, the majority of my life grew up in the state of Illinois, not just the city I've actually moved out. I've lived in central Illinois too. Um, so I consider myself an Illinoisan. Um, I moved here uh, a little over a decade ago. Um, wanted to start a new life for my now young family. I had just gotten married, just had my son, um, saw the economic wins, and I left. I was actually chasing a completely different career. I was a, I enlisted in the military right out of high school. In fact, I wasn't even out of high school. I enlisted at 17 with a parental waiver um, before 9-11. So I was last of the BLA can be arrow. I served uh, nine years total in the military, active duty and National Guard combined. I did a combat tour, Afghanistan. Thank um, you for your service, man. No, no problem. Um, but, you know, I had a completely different career field in mind. I was actually chasing uh, law enforcement. Unfortunately, my deployment to Afghanistan would cost me that. I won't get into the specifics of that, but I had to shift gears. I had a newborn son, a young marriage that, you know, was getting, trying to get its footing, so I had to find something quick. So I moved here to Texas and I stumbled in the automotive field by complete accident. Um, I won't go into too much here, but uh, there's actually a gentleman that works at Huff Finds. He's the reason I got here. And to this day, his name is Keith. He knows who he is. If he ever watches this, and I'm forever thankful, you know, because it changed my life, obviously for the better. I have uh, worked from literally full-blown abstract poverty into a acceptable middle-class living now. Thank you to this path. Awesome. So, And I've always been a Chevy fanatic since I was a kid. My father, got his first Corvette in 1993 when I was 10 years old. And uh, I was already into vets from diecast, if you can't tell. I've done a diecast fan since it was as long as I can remember. And uh, when my dad got his first Corvette, I've been obsessed ever since. So you just answered a couple of the questions that I had, but I want you to go a little more deep into the diecast, but I was gonna ask you what, where your passion came from. Now we know it's from your father. He it, had... it, it, was, um, it was my father. After he got his first Corvette, he immediately uh, got involved in a Corvette club. And I'll say their name because they were nice enough to accept me on, his, on Facebook, even though I'm not up there anymore. It was Northern Rays Corvette Club. They remember the National uh, Council of Corvette Clubs. They, uh, you know, almost immediately after he got a Corvette, he got involved with them. And ironically, they were doing a, uh, a photo op where they had the entire club out on a lawn in Itasca, Illinois, where they had everybody done. And I have the picture. I had to take it out of here because the sun was damaging it. Took it home. But, you know, since he was a new member, his car would be in the back. But we went for this big group photo, and that was my first time ever going to a car event. And I, here I am, young 10-year-old me with this flash camera, which I still have, ironically. I have that camera, and I was just taking pictures of these cars. And the whole car culture just kind of grew on me. And I had such a fun experience at this get-together 
that I never went back. And then that became my thing. We started going to, you know, of course, club events, autocross racing, drag races, and uh, auto shows like the Chicago Auto Show and McCormick Place. Those are from Illinois know this. Um, and other events like Bloomington Gold was sure. the biggest Corvette show, of course, in the world for the longest time before Carlisle took over. And I went to that uh, back when it was actually in Bloomington. And uh, those were the events that built up my adolescence in the teenage years. And, and I've always been a Chevy fanatic, of course, uh, sometimes to my siblings detriment, like you're, you're gonna, you should work for Chevrolet cause you love it. And little <laughs> did they know how foretelling that would be yeah, that's crazy. because I was, I always wanted, uh, in fact, but my first love was actually was not Corvette as far as wanting to own it. My first love was actually Chevy Impala's. Um, my dad had a 1973 Impala and I got so many good memories in that car. Unfortunately, he had to sell it. Uh, didn't have inherit that. So my, uh, my first car, uh, actually being an, an inherited pan me down, but, uh, my first toy would end up being a 97 Camaro. And then from there, it would evolve into other cars, so Chevy Caprice, muscle car, I, uh, Malibu SS and others. But obviously, thanks to you and others at Bloomington Gold 2022 made my Corvette dream come true, getting an almost identical spec Corvette to my dad's, only a year newer. But ironically, we did at the same age. My dad got his first Corvette at age 39, right before his 40th birthday, and I copied him, literally, <laughs> with the same exact spec fit, just one year newer. He had a 91, black on black, and I had a 92, black on black. There you go. Yeah. So, well, that's awesome, man. So now let's go ahead and get into the Hot Wheels because you obviously have hundreds and hundreds uh, of Hot Wheels. You, so uh, where did that come from? Okay, well, buyers, um, collectors beware. You got to be careful with this hobby because your spouse may get very upset with you with the amount of money you spend on it. And uh, it be, can become abundant and not suddenly realize I'm out of room. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it honestly, it kind of goes in tandem with the car field. Guys that love cars usually also love die cast. I mean, even if they're not obsessive like this, um, you usually will go to a, a, a car guy will have usually even little ones just laying around place sure, to place, or they'll sure. have like little, you know, 118, 124 scales sitting around on their desk. And um, I just, I kind of, I had, I, I loved it as a kid. I always played with Hot Wheels when I was a kid. I had a neighbor and we would do Absolutely. the track things the, and all of the color changers, all that stuff. Um, and then as I got older, of course, I got out of that, but I maintained interest in just the higher end stuff. Like, because my dad had gotten me, uh, right after he got the Corvette and he saw the love there, he it, invested in a, what they called at the time, a Frank Limit subscription. So for a year, every month, a new Frank Limit would come in. The first one, of course, was a 53 Corvette. Then it was a 57 and I started sure. getting them every month and he did that for me. And at the time, Frank Lament was making them. I still have every one of those sitting over there. Nice. And uh, so as I got older, even though um, I wasn't collecting the Hot Wheels anymore, I was collecting the larger ones from time to time if I stumbled on them. But then when I started working here again, it kind of brought the bug back. And then on top of that, as my son got older, he wanted to play with cars. So it kind of went in tandem. I bought Hot Wheels for my cars. And I was like, oh, they made a Camaro. That looks good. You know, and, and then it's, you know, right. it kind of started that again. And it was to say it became, I got into the diecast culture. Sweet. You know? What other hobbies do you have, uh, you know, including your family, et cetera? You know, honestly, you know, because of the demands of raising kids and all that, I've kind of, I wouldn't say I've dropped some of my hobbies, but I'm not into them as much as I used to be. I mean, sure. I, um, you know, it's basic stuff. I mean, even though I don't look at it anymore, I still, you know, do physical fitness. Um, I do uh, like um, hiking, I like fishing. I do nice. place, I, I'm not that good, but I play sports, um, like, you know, with my kids and whatnot, uh, basketball, football, things of that nature. Sure. Uh, but as far as hobby hobbies, um, generally speaking, I mean, aside from, you know, die cast collecting, car related, you know, stuff, I haven't done too much like I used to in the past. Um, I, you know, back when budget allowed for it, I used to go shooting, uh, you know, sure. you, know, you know, recreational shooting. Um, I would go uh, hiking and I would, um, you know, get into other things. I was, I'm kind of a nerd too, you know, like, you know, you're into Captain America. Okay. Well, I was a Spider-Man guy, so nice. I would collect comics and I would go to comic cons and, nice. you know, related nerdy things, you know? <laughs> so it was kind of weird. I, you know, I was an army guy and then I'm also a nerd and, you know, I just kind of had this really mixed bag way about me, you sure. know, so. <laughs> awesome. All right. This one, you only have I'm going to give you 10 seconds to answer this one. Mm -hmm. If you could have any Corvette in the world, what Corvette would it be? 1995 ZR1, black on black. That's a great answer. Yes. I, and uh, why? Because my dad's last Corvette was a 95 ZR1, black Sweet. on black. 
I've got the it, to this day the fastest I have ever been in a vehicle sitting in a vehicle uh, was in that car um, on I-57 heading towards moving to gold <laughs> back in uh, 1998. I uh, remember very well, and uh, but I've got a lot of memories with that car. It is the last of the King of the Hills. Nice. It is the ultimate C4 because it is all the late you know the same oh, logic, yeah. latest improvements, whatnot. Yes. You know, I will have to note on a footnote if I could also throw in a 19 ZR1 with that oh, in, yeah. in Admiral Blue um, with the low wing because I like top speed. Sorry. <laughs> um, that would be my uh, it, kind of a, almost a tie, but I would love to have a 95 ZR1. Awesome. And i sorry I broke 10 seconds. My bad. No, no, no that's okay. <laughs> so, Robert, I know you form a lot of really great relationships here with your customers at Corvette World. Can you tell us about maybe one that sticks out to you and why? Yeah. Uh, my first year here, 2016, I think it was, yeah, it was December 2016. It was, uh, it was, it was late in the year, of course, cold out. Um, we had this customer came in and uh, he was on a very heavily modified car we had. Now, we don't do modified cars anymore at the time we were. And uh, Eddie McBee, my partner, um, who had worked here 20 years and, uh, you know, still is, I consider, you know, a really close friend. He, uh, he said this customer was re really knowledgeable about cars and, you know, but he just, he doesn't do modified cars. It wasn't his thing. So, you know, he's like, you know, can you help me with this customer? He's really straightforward, Robert, you know, so see, I'm like, okay, fine. So I meet this guy and right away, he's kind of standoffish, you know, a little bit. I mean, I could tell he, he tell we were kind of like, yeah, we're just a bunch of jicky salesmen. And I was like, oh, okay, well, let's, uh, let's go have fun with this car. I had picked up this car. This is one of the handful of times we've taken a car from auction, but this car was very nice, heavily modified. We actually had it retuned here. So it was pushing a ton of power. Um, so I, I said to Eddie, yeah, I'll take it because I usually did the modified heavy Z06s and whatnot. So we go on a test drive and, um, you know, I, did, I decided to take it first. I say, here, let me show you what this car can do. And I had done this, you know, already at least several dozen times already. So I was getting confident. Well, the problem was this, the way this car was tuned, it had excessive low end torque and it was cold outside. So as we make the turn on our test drive route, you know, to start the main drive on Luna Road back here, I decided to really get on it and I had the car go sideways. <laughs> and um, not bragging, but I had military police training. So I went and, you know, I was able to correct it and whatnot. Now, when it was all said and done, I'm white knuckling the steering wheel. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I'm gonna get fired. This guy's gonna start freaking out. And I look over and he just starts laughing at me. He just starts laughing. He's like, you should see your face and good recovery. So I was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so after that, I think it's kind of lightened up and uh, actually the rest of the test drive went well and he would end up buying the car. And uh, I would end up seeing him a couple times, not always for the best reasons, because he kept throwing belts. He would be a service customer and he kept throwing belts. Uh, that wasn't any fault of us or him or anything. It was just the way the car was so heavily modified, it was over torquing the belt and we were snapping them. That's what happens when you deal with modified cars. But, you know, a few months in, in 2017, he starts talking about, you know, you watch Street Speed 717. I'm like, yeah, yeah I know. I, I stumbled on his channel. He's got that bowling ball Corvette, you know, the one seen right up there. And I was like, yeah, that's a great channel. And I started watching all these other guys. and. He's like, you know, I'm thinking about starting my own YouTube channel. I'm like, well, that's awesome. Cool. Uh, you know, would you ever want to be in it sometime? I was like, yeah, sure. Well, long story short, uh, that would become a routine of ours. And uh, that customer's name was Mike Brink. <laughs> and he, of course, is the man behind this channel. So why is that the most notable? And that is because of the obvious. Because what started off as the only time I almost wrecked the car on a test drive with a guy who was I thought was very standoff. So I'm like, man, this guy's going to. <laughs> guy's a bit of a dick. <laughs> That's part of my language. <laughs> but no, he ended up being a really great guy. And, uh, and here we are today, uh, you know, you know, eight, almost eight years later. And look what we've grown of it, you know, and all the people we've met. Ironically, I mentioned Street Speed 717. I ended up meeting him at Carlisle along with it, Shane and all these other guys and, and how this community has grown and all the affiliate. You guys know everybody, you know, that's been affiliated and has filmed here because there's been many YouTubers that have filmed here too. And it's been, it's been a wonderful experience, but I think, you know, that, that would be the most memorable test drive because of what became of it years later, you know? Well, I appreciate so. that, man. It was a great memory for me as yeah. well. And I love the relationship that we formed. Yeah. And again, it's not, I want to throw it out there. I know if letting you watch and have been a customers of mine, not demoting any of you all, but I had to throw that in there because, you know, again, when he says most memorable, I have to be honest with myself. That is definitely the most memorable. Okay, so we're going to wrap up here by letting everyone know that if you didn't know, Corvette World Rob has actually started his own channel. Yes, we do have a, um, a YouTube channel called 
simply Corvette World Dallas. Let me get it pulled up here. You see here we are featuring three wheels. It's actually Corvette World. And um, my Houston store has a channel too, but this the Corvette World specifically is for the Dallas store. And we feature usually three cars a week. And we try to, you know, do a featurette on at least um, several notable cars in our inventory. And it's already been a pretty good success for just kicking it off within a couple months. We've already got uh, a little over uh, 2,300 subscribers. And uh, I've already had numerous customers that have come in and purchased with these videos, you know, highlighting them. Um, I, in fact, we had a, my partner, Jim, you know, who works with me here, he had a customer that wanted him to video the car to verify everything he saw in the video. And he, he was so impressed by what we do here that he bought the car. And if he's watching this right now, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I'm representing Corvette World and we feature our inventory. So if you um, are curious, even if you're just, again, I, I made the slogan when I started working here, every day is a car show. So even if you got your vet, you're happy and you just want car content, our videos are usually two to four minutes at the most. We feature a car. Just for a like, if you if you enjoy your content on uh, Brink Speech Channel, you like deal, like me, um, you know, please subscribe, give a thumbs up, make a comment, even if it's just say, hey, nice one, nice car, or blah, blah blah. I mean, that's fine, you know. Give your honest opinion, you know. We want to see it here. I mean, I want to try to grow this channel, you know. It's uh, not just to be an advertisement for Corvette World, but also again as another you know, way to exhibit the awesome inventory you have here, you know, because yes, this is a job for me, but it's also a passion. I wouldn't be right. doing all this if it wasn't a passion. I, I really do. I mean, I understand used car salesmen are used car salesmen. I mean, watch the movie True Lies. I get it. Oh. Hey, hey, you mind keeping it under 90? I'm still trying to pay for this dental work. Guys, used car salesman. I, every time I watch that movie, it's like, oh, God, that's me. The Corvette. <laughs> no, I'm not that kind of guy, and I'm not that kind of salesman. And, look, I can't make every customer happy, but if I can make 99% of my customers happy and have a wonderful experience, especially if they're getting their first Corvette, I try to do so. And, uh, and thanks to everybody, I now have a, my own Corvette, even though I'm trying to sell it right now. It's still, you know, I'm part of the family in more ways than one, and I'm happy to be here. And I want to grow on that. And uh, I would appreciate anybody to come over and help us out with that venture. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Robert. I think everybody has gotten to know you very well from this video. Well, for, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm kind of the ugly one in the camera here, so I don't know why everybody likes me so much, but I really do appreciate it. I really uh, love all you guys. Thank you for everything. Um, even if you've made, even if God forbid, you know, you watch this, but you know, you think I'm a schlub look or whatever, still appreciate you watching this video and thank you for all the kind words over the years. Awesome.